thanks. It's great to be here with you all. It's great to have you all here. Every time I see that Megatransect video, my feet start to itch again, and I love Mike and Nick even more. So from the Megatransect to the last wild places, from 20 years ago to today, we're going to have a conversation about the last wild places, what that phrase implies, what that phrase mandates. And joining me for this conversation are four dedicated conservationists. Uh, from Mozambique, Dominique Gonsalves. <laughs> Coming to us from uh, DRC Congo, Naftali Honig. <laughs> Sean Garrity of American Prairie Reserve from a place called Montana. And Enrique Sala from where? For, I think Enrique swam in from Tahiti. So, I have here a mid 20th century information storage and retrieval device. Um, <laughs> And I'm using it because I want to start by reminding us all verbatim of something that Gary Nell said um, yesterday morning. Gary said this. In 2050, we're living in a world of 10 billion people. And this is, as I say verbatim, I think he did use the present tense because of the immediacy. We're living in a world of 10 billion people. How are we going to feed all those people? and give them energy, and educate them, and house them without burning up everything else on the planet? That is the existential question that National Geographic should own." Close quote. Well, uh, amen. Uh, and I would add the obvious. We should not only own that question, but we should all do our ever-loving best to answer it. And that's the essence of the Last Wild Places initiative of the National Geographic Society, um, hand in hand with the National Geographic Magazine, and, uh, National Geographic Partners, and also with other partners, certain visionary and entrepreneurial private conservation organizations that work on large scale landscape conservation. And, um, these four people represent some of those organizations. There are lots of last wild places around the world. What we have here is our representatives from a selection of a few of those places that uh, uh, represent spots where innovative and um, uh, instructional uh, efforts are being made to, to highlight and preserve these last wild places. So um, Dominique, Dominique Gonsalves, she is an elephant ecologist working at Gorongosa National <coughs> Park. She works not just on elephant ecology, but on elephant-human conflict. And she also is involved with a very important initiative, the girls' clubs um, of, that have been organized by the park project in villages surrounding uh, Gorongosa National Park. Uh, those uh, girl, girls' clubs help to promote education and health and prevent early marriage. Very important. Dominique. Thank you. I am a Mozambican born near Gorongosa National Park. I'm joyful that National Geographic has included Gorongosa Park in its last Wild Places program. I'd like all of you to make a dream with me that will come true in 25 years from now. I dream that the Gorongosa ecosystem will have 10,000 elephants living a safe, happy, and peaceful life. I dream that the larger Gorongosa landscape will have tens of thousands of women and girls who can read and write and who also living a safe, happy, and peaceful life. Those two goals are more closely connected than you might think. The picture I paint today for the next 25 years was certainly not possible a quarter century ago when I was born. 
My country endured a civil war in which 95% of the elephants in Gorongosa were killed for the ivory that was traded for weapons. Only about 100 remained. My country endured a civil war in which more than 1 million people died. And the year I was born, more than 95% of the women who live near Gorongosa, civil war survivors, were illiterate and impoverished. But I believe that my optimistic view of the future will come true. Our Gorongosa project implements a landscape scale conservation approach in which we take care of humans and wildlife, and we create a positive relationship between the two. In Gorongosa, we see conservation and human development as the two sides of the same coin. Another woke up this morning, she went to school. And afternoon, she went to an after-school program called Girls Club. It is sponsored by the park. We have child marriage in Mozambique, but Anora, she won't be married at the age of 13. She won't be pregnant when she is 14. We will help her finish high school, and she will have a life full of opportunities. We recognize that the greater Gorongos ecosystem is full of wildlife and people, so the park needs to create an healthy environment for both. There's nothing better we can do for humans than sending girls to school. When girls get an education, they benefit their communities for generations to come. I was fortunate. My parents told me that education is something no one can take away from you. So communities that benefit from the park with education, healthcare, agriculture support, and employment will in turn support the park. It's a virtuous cycle. What about the dream of 10,000 elephants? I work with the scientific department in the elephant project. Our elephants are recovering fast. We now have more than 700. It's a great increase from the 100 that survived the war. But there's a lot we don't know yet about our elephants. I'm about to start a PhD, and I hope to understand more about that. I, I hope to understand the movement across the landscape and how it relates to the park's ecology and all the communities that live around the park. Elephants need a lot of space. I often drive close to them to study their behavior. Many times they'll charge at me, and let me tell you, that is scary. But imagine you living close to them. So elephants need plenty of land, which upon they will live, and humans. Humans need their separate space so they can have schools, farms, health clinics, and markets. That's why the landscape scale approach we're running with fund, plan, and implement programs through our national park and the village around are the, is the way of the future. And why would these people be even willing to live close to these animals and even protect elephants and other species from poachers? It's because the park is the larger employer in the province, and one day is the second largest, and one day will be the largest. The park provides health care for more than 100,000 people per year. Our girls club are in more than 50 schools now. So, but there's also a deeper reason. This wildlife is our cultural and biological heritage. Our spiritual beliefs are tied to those animals. We have almost doubled the size of Gorongosa earlier this year, but my long-term dream sees us expanding even more. Why do I set my dream in 25 years? It's because the Gorongosa project is a public-private partnership between the government of Mozambique and a US-based car foundation. Last week, we signed a contract extending this relationship for another quarter century. So I intend to be in Gorongosa in 25 years, and I'm going to keep an eye on both of the elephants and on the young girls. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, Naftali Honig 
is a wildlife crime investigator. Uh, he has worked in various parts of Central Africa, including both Congos and Chad. Uh, he's the founder of the group Eagle, Eco Activists for Governance and Law Enforcement. And he's now with the organization African Parks, uh, working in Garamba National Park in DRC, Congo. Naftali. So I live here in Garamba National Park, um, working for African Parks in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, this is the Garamba River, and it's sort of the extremity of the Congo Basin all the way up against the, the Nile Basin, the Continental Divide, where, where the two basins meet, the biggest basin and the longest river basin in Africa. Um, my background is in wildlife crime investigation, and um, for when I was in my early 20s, I did my first sting operations, undercover operations with traffickers, especially in urban settings, but also in nearby protected areas and in the periphery, and uh, and bringing wildlife traffickers to justice by following up with prosecutions as well. Um, in doing that, uh, we always we were able to to create a deterrent and fight wildlife crime by by punishing people who are doing uh, illegal illegal criminal activity with with wildlife products like ivory and pangolin scales. But I wanted to do a bit more, so I founded a sniffer dog program to be able to detect illegal wildlife products and then also to be able to create a, a more preventative deterrent. So at the same time that, um, of course, you can catch a bad guy if you put some dogs in an airport, you can also let everybody know that those dogs are there. And then maybe people won't do the crime in the first place. And in terms of not doing crime in the first place, there's no better place to think about those types of problems than in a national park. And so about these are some, some hard bees running through Garamba. That's what it looks like when the grass is low. And so about two years ago, I joined African Parks to get back into protected areas to be able to think about those problems, preventative problems, working on conservation intelligence. And uh, there's no better metric, of course, than, than, than being able to see actual poaching numbers go down and wildlife numbers going up. And in Garamba, over the last couple of years, well, from 2016 to 2017, we've seen a 45% reduction in elephant carcasses. And we're expecting a much larger reduction um, uh, at the end of 2018 as well. And um, <laughs> the, um, the combination of my sort of traditional background in, in looking at wildlife crime, I'm met in a protected area with the need for technology. It's the, it's, it, I might be the last one to the table in this, but you realize that there are technologies that we're even using now in Garamba, which were not available even last Explorer Symposium, and we're we're, um, we're using things like, for example, traditional methods of detecting a fire like aerial surveillance that might indicate a poacher is inside the park. But what about using remote sensing to, to predict where those, those poachers might be entering or exiting the park? And then taking an entire dry season's worth of d data and combining it with, with elephant collar data as well, using elephants as sensors as well. And, uh, and then we're able to see, for instance, where they might prefer, if they like long grass or short grass, and that might, might um, inform fire management plans and other things. And obviously we use, there's a world of remote sensing available to us now, especially with things like um, uh, monitoring agricultural through, agriculture through uh, change detection, through satellite imagery, or even refugee camps. And obviously we have quite a complex conflict dynamics in Garamba. And so we, we monitor things like the head stamps on ammunition as well. Um, the foundation for that is location intelligence, and you've all probably used location intelligence, which is now ubiquitous in your day-to-day -day lives, whether you're looking for directions to get to a friend's house or whether you're looking for a nearby restaurant. And that is the foundation that conservation needs to catch up with a little bit and get up to that speed so that we're treating our elephants um, with that much attention um, and digitally transform conservation where we have sort of um, a replica of everything, of everything that is from assets to elephants, and, and we're able to see that and monitor that with, uh, with a new level of intensity. So here's an example of that where we can actually monitor with a mixture of human reporting, of community reporting with uh, remote sensing, and we're able to sort of track the movement of nomads as they approach our protected area. And without a single shot being fired, in this particular instance, we could actually sort of communicate, figure out a way to communicate with those nomads and have them not come into the protected area and poach uh, before it ever starts. 
So that's sort of the, the, most, the most significant impact is when nothing, when you see nothing and you just have elephants. And of course, this is sort of rendering a whole new, a whole new um, arena for explorers in this space, whether it be with remote sensing or collaring or unmanned sensors, the transmission of data, um, machine learning. So there's so much exciting new space um, in this in conservation intelligence. And all of that could only be possible through a very robust public-private partnership management agreements, delegated management, which is what African Parks brings to the table. And so I'm very, very grateful to be able to work with organizations like National Geographic and African Parks in developing technology for conservation intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Naftali. Sean Garrity is CEO of American Prairie Reserve, and I should, I'd like to add that he is, he's not the founder of that, but he essentially has built that organization over recent decades more than any other single individual. It's an organization uh, in, uh, whose dream, whose goal, whose purpose is to connect, restore, and protect eventually 3.5 million acres of native grassland in northeastern Montana. And part of what he and his colleagues are working to achieve is not only protecting that area, but bringing or facilitating or enhancing connectedness for grizzly bears and wolves along dispersal corridors from the American Prairie Reserve to Glacier National Park to Yellowstone National Park to Grasslands National Park in Canada. Uh, Sean. Thank you. Well, the goal of the American Prairie Reserve Project is to create the largest wildlife uh, assemblage ever uh, constructed in the continental United States. When finished, we'll be at about three and a half million acres here in Montana. And at that time, it'll be about a million acres larger than Yellowstone Park and bigger than Yellowstone and Glacier Parks combined. And we're working here in what's called the Missouri Breaks and the surrounding grasslands. The conditions are extraordinary. One, people have been moving out steadily for over 100 years. Most of it has never been plowed up. It's native grass like it has looked for thousands of years. And it's got an amazing wildlife history. So these conditions and others, we believe, make it an ideal spot to pursue this vision. We've been laser focused on three things for the last 17 years to keep momentum and achievement going. One is putting all the landscape together, it's critical. Being able to remodel that to maximize nature and ensuring that the people in the surrounding area for sure and those visiting now from around the world are experiencing benefits all the way along. Land buying is going pretty well. We could go faster with more money, but we've done 26 large scale property acquisitions. We have about 400,000 acres now. Uh, each acquisition, we do about uh, 35,000 acres annually. That's about the size of the city of Washington, D.C. We're working on all these big critters, but not just the big stuff, bringing their populations back. Also pollinators and reptiles, and grassland birds are vitally important. We're shooting for a holistic result where all of the historic animals are close to being back in historic proportions and populations. We think this can be done. When we finally achieve this, about 5,000 square miles in area, about the size of the Serengeti, will create, obviously, a wildlife spillover situation into the surrounding area. Well, there's about 200 large-scale cattle ranchers there running 450,000 cows. We want them to be winners, not losers, in this story. Got an idea from Namibia, started it four years ago, a for-profit company, the only wildlife-friendly food label in the United States, where we take money from that company and we pay ranchers to be more biodiversity or nature-friendly in the way they run their cattle operations. As we start to pepper this outside area with these types of ranches, we are increasing social caring capacity or tolerance for wildlife in this area over time. Uh, we're taking this concept bigger and moving out into 200 mile long corridors out from our ecosystem to connect to other important ecosystems that are also anchored by other big parks. So in my early 40s, in the middle of a different career, I quit my day job to cut over and to lead the beginning of this project. I knew at the time, given the 30 year time horizon, that I, this is gonna take longer than my working lifetime. 
So I've had to think about uh, succession and forward momentum and progress beyond me even since day one. And day one, like all entrepreneurial efforts, was a little tough. We didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of people. For that reason, we couldn't buy any land. Unfortunately, we had no fundraising experience. That was really inconvenient. <laughs> the people we talked to where we wanted to do the project didn't want to see us. They didn't want to hear about this vision. We didn't see a year and a half later after we started the project, there's going to be a massive stock market crash. Other than that, our enthusiasm was through the roof. <laughs> Persistence was the order of the day. Fast forward 17 years, things are looking a whole lot better. It's almost a life of its own to this organization, which I'm very proud of. We've raised quite a bit of money. We need tons more. The financial support is a lot better than it was in the early 2000s. I can tell you that. It's gratifying. We brought in a lot of properties, as I've just said, and continue to go with that. And we're bringing a lot of wildlife back that's been gone for a very long time. Um, probably the thing I'm most happy about is we've done lots of things to set up the organization culture for the long term and the power of the organization. One, just one thing. I hired this young woman when she was uh, 26. Uh, time flies. She's now 27. Or 30. 30. <laughs> Can you reset the clock? Uh, time flies. She's now 37. And a couple months ago, we made her CEO of the organization. She's a dynamo leader. So the point of this project Role. Thank you. Uh, the point of this project is to build a project, a, a reserve that's going to last for a very long time, both scientifically and sociologically for hundreds of years into the future um, and beyond. But if you've heard this emerging idea that we want to save half the earth for nature by 2050 or so, if we're going to do that, we need a lot more projects going on around the world than just this one or the folks we're working on. To do that, we've got to fix the financial models. There's tons of money out there, very little available for saving nature. But more than anything, I think we need more entrepreneurial people to maybe do what I did a very long time ago, hopefully some of you, to quit your day job and to take on projects like this. Are they hard? Absolutely. But they're more fun and personally rewarding than you can possibly imagine. So I hope you'll think about it. Because if not, if not us and you, then who? Thank you. make some good points, and, um, and one of them is that this clock wasn't working. <laughs> That's right. We've got it now, I think, right? It'll be helpful to Enrique. Um, <laughs> so, so keep it short. Keep it really short. Enrique, Enrique Sala is founder and leader of Pristine Seas, which is a marine conservation and science organization. It's now part of um, National Geographic. Uh, Enrique leads biodiversity, uh, diving biodiversity surveys all over the world. Uh, from the southern line islands to uh, the Franz Josef Land Archipelago in the Russian Arctic, where I had the pleasure of spending six weeks on a boat with him eating thawed out Soviet era cod. Um, and he also does high level, high level conservation diplomacy. So if you need a conservationist in a wetsuit or in a tuxedo, he's your guy. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So if you jumped into any random spot in the ocean, you'll probably see something like this. Empty of large animals, because we have taken them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. But there are a few places out there, still wild, that have remained relatively safe from human action. And this is what we have been doing at Pristine Seas for the last 10 years. We have explored, surveyed, and documented some of the last wild places left in the ocean and work with governments to protect them. We've been to 24 places, 18 of which, these ones here in green, 18 of which are already protected in no take fully protected marine reserves without fishing, oil mining, or any other extractive activities, covering a total area of 5 million square kilometers. That's half the size of Canada. Thank you. And these places range from the Russian Arctic to Antarctica, the southern tip of uh, the Americas. And David and I are going back to the Russian Arctic next summer. But this time we'll bring a Spanish cook, don't worry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, when we started the project, only 0.1% of the ocean was fully protected. Today, 10 years later, it's 2%. You know, it's great progress, but it's not enough. 
studies suggest that at least 30% of the ocean should be protected, hopefully 50%, that half Earth thing, not just to save marine life, but to save ourselves. So what can we learn from what we have done in the last 10 years, not just us, but other, other groups? How can we scale up? You know, and our pristine seas board member, Steve Case, once asked us, what's the secret sauce of, of pristine seas? And it's not as sophisticated as a sauce by Jose Andres, but uh, you know, I'm going to give you a few ingredients. One, we had a clear vision and measurable objectives. We want an, to see an ocean full of wildlife that continues providing for us. And that it means that we need to have large wilderness areas that are functioning ecosystems. So we decided to try to help protect 20 of the wildest places in the ocean by 2020. We wanted to put ourselves out of business. Uh, let's get the job done and then let's move to the next thing. Second ingredient, we for the first time in the, in the ocean um, realm here, we have combined the things that National Geographic is so well known for, exploration, research, and storytelling. We conduct scientific expeditions to answer the question, why is this place important? Why is it unique? We conduct scientific research, publish it in peer-reviewed journals, write reports to governments, showing the biodiversity value of these places. But that is not enough. Is that place threatened? Is there an urgency? So we use satellite data, among other things, for example, to see where, where fishing is happening. But the fishing industry is never happy. So we have to produce economic analysis showing the benefits of protection. And in the case of the Galapagos Islands, for example, we were able to show that a living shark brings in more than $5 million over its lifetime through diving tourism while f kill killing it and selling the fins to the Asian uh, trader brings only $200 to that fisherman. Third ingredient is strategic communications. You know, we just don't throw things out and hope that uh, somebody will be inspired and, and do something about it. Sometimes we have an audience of one, you know, the president or prime minister or the minister that has to make the decision about protecting the place. So we have produced stories to inspire that one person of a small or a small circles. We have produced one minute videos that only one person has seen that are more, have, been, have had more impact in conservation of the ocean than a one hour award winning uh, feature film. And finally, a fourth ingredient, we need to develop good partnerships. Of course, you know, we don't protect places. Governments protect places. Local communities protect places. But somebody has to provide the scientific, economic, and emotional evidence, the assets, to inspire those leaders. Some of, remember some of the places we've been to are very remote, like the Russian Arctic. There are places where there is very, very little information about. In some cases, we work alone, because we are the only ones welcome there. <laughs> In other places, we walk, we walk, uh, we work with um, local research institutions and conservation organizations. And we have developed uh, three rules for a successful partnership. It might seem silly, but this is very important. One is we need to have clear shared goals that are measurable. We have to agree on what we want to accomplish by when. Second, we need to be very honest about each one's capabilities and responsibilities. We have to assign clear responsibilities. Everything has to be crystal clear. And third, and very important that we discovered along the way, as we worked successfully with some partners and very unsuccessfully with others, is that we need to agree on how to celebrate success. And that's very important because egos get in the way of conservation. And we have seen, unfortunately, a few examples uh, in the last 10 years. So we have to agree that we are going to celebrate the leaders and the communities that protect these places, not ourselves. In the next uh, two years, our team at Pristine Seas, are, we are confident that we're going to achieve our goal of 20 of the wildest places left in the ocean protected. And then we will move to the next big challenge. Thank you. All right. Very good, very good, thank you. Um, I set a conversation. Uh, I have some questions, I hope you have some questions. 
And you all should feel free to question each other, too, one another. So it's, you know, feel free to jump in, um, um, query uh, somebody else's project, uh, and, uh, and interaction is, is, is fine here. But I want to begin with one question that was raised yesterday morning at the town hall. Um, after, after Jonathan and Gary had given what I thought were very eloquent and clear presentations on the new shape of National Geographic, the society, the partners, the lenses, the initiatives, the vision, um, someone raised the objection that National Geographic seems to be leaving humans out of the picture. And I'd like to just go right into that. Is it true? Do you feel that in your projects, are you leaving humans out of the conservation picture? Now, Dominique, you, you have already <coughs> told us some very interesting things about Gorongosa, but give us one more instance of the way uh, humans are or are not being left out of the picture at Gorongosa. Well, as I said before, Dave, uh, for us humans, human development is another side for our story. So Gorongosa, we, we really um, think on the human side because there's nothing we can do to protect that habitat, that landscape, the elephants, without the human part. We do include humans as in every, every program we think. Tell thinking us a little about the agriculture. Exactly. The agriculture, for example, we have a buffer zone that we call sustainable buffer zone, but there's a lot of people live. These people, agriculture in Mozambique is still the primary uh, way source to get money, but we need to make it more sustainable. No more slashing barn, no more moving away and destroying habitat. So we need to improve to help these farmers to get cash, cash crops, to get more nutritious food. And this is one of the things that our agriculture program does. We support them providing seeds. It's not just providing, it's like an agreement, it's a contract. We provide seeds, you work with us, and then you give the seeds back that will go, is gonna go to other farmer, Coffee, and so cashew. On. Coffee, cashew, and many, many other things. I think that what's happening really is that humans are, uh, what was the comment that you said exactly? Being left out of the picture. Okay, humans are leaving the rest of life on the planet out of the picture. This is what's happening, right? And uh, this, uh, in, the, in the ocean, what we have seen is that, um, well, and also on the land, it's folly to pretend that we can exploit everything to build uh, a human construct. You know, we, we know of all these civilizations that have collapsed because of our exploitation of natural resources linked with uh, some climate um, irregularity. We have climate irregularities every single year now, right? We have the thousand year, or the thousand year storm of 500 year flood. And it, it is really folly and it shows how stupid humans can be also, but not realizing that without that life support system, you know, there is no humans, you know, there are no humans on the moon, right? So I think that um, there is a big problem of, um, I don't know if it's ignorance or is uh, denial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, even the Pope is telling us that we are not masters or even stewards, we are citizens yeah. of, or, uh, of an uh, interdependent community. Right? Yeah. yeah. Sean, you have very ticklish relations with, uh, and some good, some uh, difficult, with um, the ranching community surrounding APR. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Well, there's two constituents that we think about in terms of human beings and benefiting them. In the immediate surrounding area, I think just cutting a hole in this map and putting in this Serengeti-sized thing with grizzly bears and wolves that they took a long time getting rid of, uh, you have to figure out how to benefit that cattle ranching uh, environment because it's going to be there for a long time. And I, we don't want to build walls like some people. So we want to have, we want to have a, a blended landscape, but we have to help, help them out. This is costly to have that kind of wildlife around, so we figure out a monetary way to make them benefit uh, for that. That's the Wild Sky Beef Program and others. The other constituents that I think about, though, one of my favorite books, I know probably everybody in this room has read it, is uh, Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre, is when I talk to kids these days, even in Montana, they don't know this thing exists. They haven't been out on that landscape that I showed. 
And so we're doing everything we can to draw people out. We're building one of the largest hut to hut systems, 200 miles wide. It's inexpensive, so families can come out. It's already up and running right now. Uh, places where you can camp, very, very small places tucked away in this three and a half million acre area. Everything we can figure out to get people there, because as we bring people out and they see it, they fall in love and they become ravenous to try to figure out how to help us protect it. So what's happening is people are getting more distant from nature and they vote stupidly, I think, mm -hmm. and they don't vote for nature. You don't see money going to this, you go see, you see money going to build sports stadiums instead. And things like, you know, not that much money is coming to nature because people have become disconnected to it. They've got to reconnect it to it, bring them back out in it. Um, going to something a little bit more um, uh, grim and... Um, this is for you. This is for you, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Neftali. Uh, war is one of the factors that makes anti-poaching efforts much more difficult and makes poaching uh, much more of a problem. Um, how does that figure around Garamba? Well, <clears throat> on the community note, um, that there, there's, a, there's a connection between that and the, and the question that you just asked about communities as well. And uh, we actually have a, a, a common need with the communities that surround Garamba and the area, which is stability. If there are sort of roving bands of armed groups that can cross borders and come into national parks and poach and do whatever they want, those exact same people are committing a lot of atrocities on local population. We have the notorious Lord's Resistance Army that lives in the, in the periphery of the park and has thankfully been pushed slightly, slightly away, but they still have an impact on the region um, and, and a number of other armed groups in the region. So uh, in a sense, there's a, there's a bit of solidarity there with local communities because we know that to do sustainable development, we actually spend more on sustainable development than on law enforcement. And to, to be able to actually do that effectively, we need a foundation of stability. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And um, yeah, in general, it requires us to have a over the horizon perspective. So we can't think of our protected areas as fenced off. I mean, these are enormous spaces. We can't put a fence around uh, almost 15,000 square kilometers of, uh, of some of the, you know, some pretty, pretty remote bush. So um, yeah, we see it, we, it makes, a, it forces us to look at our landscape more holistically. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the long-term horizon. Uh, one of the things that's always difficult in conservation efforts is maintaining um, long-term efforts uh, beyond the professional lifetime of one individual, beyond the, per the burnout period of one individual. These are difficult jobs, difficult jobs on the ground, difficult leadership jobs. This is a question for all of you, or any of you. Tell me, um, what, can, what can you do, what can an organization do to ensure succession? Succession, not just of, of leadership and people filling jobs, but succession of the passion and the vision beyond the professional stay of one particular leader. You've done it. Uh, you're, I'm, you're, uh, well, I'm, uh, everyone will have a different point of view and a different style. Mine um, is, I think, uh, First and foremost, you gotta create a culture that attracts the right kind of people to your organization in the first place. As we started with two, we now have 45. I'm proud of every single one of them. Uh, but we have a very strong filter. It's about execution, being innovative, a lot of optimism, teamwork, and even sustainable pace. I saw a lot of burnout in my career in Silicon Valley, and this is a long haul thing. So we make people go away and take time for themselves and vacation and compensation days and stuff like that. So, getting the right people in through a very strong filter and rigorous filter of values, and then uh, looking at people and watching them for five years, 10 years or longer, and moving them steadily into leadership positions, and uh, then letting them go, like Ali. Uh, it's really, really important. And uh, getting more women involved is very helpful too, I think. Who has a concise and pointed question? <laughs> Sir. <laughs> About two or three years ago, a gentleman was here that was putting together a herd of purebred buffalo in Montana, in a several thousand or 20,000 acres or something. Do y'all coordinate on any of that? Because he was putting together, it sounded very similar to a corridor where animals could go back. Do y'all run over each other or did you buy him out? Or We hadn't heard any more from that fellow. 
I don't know if our money I mean, went to good use or not. This, is, this gets to another point, what conservation takes out of you. That was me and I didn't have gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what happened to the buffalo that I'm was only here? 45, by the way. <laughs> no. Our buffalo, we started with 16. Probably when I was here a few years ago, we are probably at about 200. We're at 850 now. We're headed for t minimum 10,000. That'll be the biggest herd on the planet. That's the purebred, no cattle in it. Correct. Who else? <laughs> Back there? Yep. Well, um, Firstly, thank you for all of what you're doing to save our own hides. Much appreciated, indeed. Um, all of you are dealing with the existential challenge of our time and how to live in a healthy planet with healthy people. And all of you have dealt with governments. So perhaps I could ask you from your experience, what do we need to do to be able to get governments and funders on side to be able to support the work that you're doing, which is to be able to score that circle of being able to deal with the 10 billion person challenge. Thanks. Dominique, do you want to say anything about the government relations of Gorongosa National Park? I, I would say that in our reality, um, Gorongosa National Park was the jewel of Mozambique and still is. So I would say, n not saying that was easy to bring the government in, but, but was more like seeing, showing the government that actually people will also benefit from the park. That people were also recovering, not only wildlife, but also people. And I think the government has seen changes, has seen results, and they love it. And they actually, they already, for example, the Girls Club, the program, the education program, the government's gonna replicate it from all country now. And many, many other initiatives we do in Gurunguza. So I think it's all about First of all, open their eyes again for our reality, our connectivity with the natural world, and also showing them results, showing them changes. Enrique, what's your, what's your secret for getting a foreign minister to say, yeah, we'll declare a new marine protected area? Well, you know, decision making is, you have rational uh, considerations and irrational considerations, right? When I was in academia before quitting to come to National Geographic, I thought that information was enough, that you could have all the scientific data or, and, or economic data and expecting the leaders to make rational decisions based on, you know, this is the right thing to do. Ha. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that's what happens when you live in the ivory tower. Um, and what we have uh, seen with uh, Pristinsis is that reversing this works. So first, we you need to have the right leader, right? It is very unlikely that uh, some administrations are going to uh, protect something, right? Some are even calling for undoing uh, national monuments, right? So first, we have to make them fall in love with uh, that place. It is very rare that the leader goes to one of these parks or dies with us or in a submarine and sees that abundance of life and doesn't fall in love with it. Once we get them, we develop, once we have developed this emotional connection, you know, then we come with the science and the economics just to support what they already know has to be done, right? And it, it is all about legacy. It is all about legacy. We have to show that economically, no, Madam President, look, the fishery industry is saying this, but these are the real data, and these are the benefits from tourism, for example. But it has to be uh, that emotional connection, the, the, the wish to leave a legacy uh, with you know, her or his name that has been the most important factor for us. Who's got a question for Naftali? A good Congo, African Parks question. There. We haven't worked him quite hard enough yet. <laughs> Sir. Thank you, my name is Carlos de Sancho. I'm the ambassador of Mozambique. Um, very proud of Dominic. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to comment uh, on on the public-private partnership. We're about to run out of time completely. Yeah, no, 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 no. I would say it's not a, a, a long thing. Okay. It, it's just to say it takes the commitment and resilience of both government and uh, the private partners because Greg Carr and the government of Mozambique worked together to make this happen. And it started many years ago. 
I personally invited Greg Hart to Mozambique 15 years ago. Wow. And because of his resilience and determination, we have what we have there. And we have uh, academics, uh, great universities, a great lab uh, that uh, was started by Ed Wilson. Uh, it, it's a great endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was very important. I'm glad we're here. This man, we owe a great debt to him, and I owe Naftali a beer. Uh, <laughs> and thank you all so much for, uh, for interacting with us. And there's more to come, so stay tuned. <laughs>